Part one. You are going to hear a conversation between a student and an academic advisor. First, you have some time to look at questions one to four. Hello there. You must be Jane. Please come in. My name is Mrs. Dunstan. Hello, Mrs. Dunstan. Pleased to meet you. All right. Now let's see. Now you're interested in attending university in Canada. Is that right? Yes. And I have a lot of questions to ask you. Okay. But before I begin to answer your questions, I need to ask you a few questions first. Now your major is engineering, mechanical engineering. Right, and where did you graduate? I graduated from the Beijing Institute of Machinery in July 1998. I completed my bachelor's degree. Okay, now I'm assuming you want to continue studying in that field. Am I right? Actually, I'd prefer to do an MBA if possible. But if I have no other choice, then I'll continue in mechanical engineering. Okay, now are you familiar with the requirements for an MBA degree? Yes. Before you hear the rest of the conversation, you have some time to look at questions five to ten. I think I need to do well on the GMAT, and I'll definitely need the TOEFL or IELTS, right? That's right. You'll need at least 600 on the TOEFL or 6.5 on IELTS. In addition, you need to have completed a bachelor's degree too. Did you take the GMAT yet? No, but I plan to take it in August. The requirements for a master's degree in engineering are a little different. You'll need to take the GRE and, of course, the TOEFL or IELTS. I see. And when do I start to apply? The best time to start the application process is in November or December of the year prior to your intended year of study. Application forms are usually available in September or October. Which schools in Canada offer the MBA degree? Of the approximately 50 universities in Canada, 20 offer an MBA. Here's a small booklet summarizing Canadian university programs. You'll find all the information on page 22. Great, thanks. And how about tuition and scholarships? Tuition for MBA programs has been steadily increasing. Some universities now charge the full tuition, meaning that there is no government subsidy. Those universities cost about ten thousand dollars per year, and it's a two-year program. Other universities are still government subsidized, so the tuition. Is only about four thousand five hundred dollars per year. In terms of scholarships, usually the top five students entering the MBA program are given a generous scholarship. All other students have to pay the full fees. International students have to pay the full tuition. That's ten thousand dollars per year. Oh, is it very difficult to get into an MBA program? Yes. In fact, the competition is very strong. MBA graduates have a pretty easy time finding a job, so many students are eager to do the program, thinking it will guarantee them success in their careers. Well, it sure does sound like an excellent way to start a promising future.、Um, what is the school year like? Classes begin in September each year and finish before Christmas. They resume after New Year and finish at the end of April. And after April? Why? That's your summer holiday. Sounds great. I want to thank you, Mrs. Dustin, for all your help. I really do appreciate it. You're very welcome. And if you have any other questions, please feel free to contact me. You know my number, right? I sure do. Thanks very much. Goodbye. That is the end of part one. You now have half a minute. 
to check your answers. Now it turns to part two. Part two. You will now hear a guide talking about an architectural development in the city of Birmingham. First, you have some time to look at questions 11 to 15. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Thanks for joining me on our monthly excursion to visit new architectural and city planning developments in our city of Birmingham. Today, as you can see, we're here at the development site of The Cube, and its construction is well underway. Indeed, the year ahead will be an exciting year for Birmingham Development Company and its construction arm, Buildability. As the construction of the Cube, the most spectacular building in Birmingham, continues at speed. This new building, valued at over £100 million, has been designed by the internationally renowned architects MAKE. Their design team, led by Ken Shuttleworth, has created a 17-storey cube aimed at providing a spectacular contrast to the increasing number of towers appearing on the Birmingham cityscape. The complex 142-week building programme that will transform the Birmingham skyline upon its completion is currently over halfway through its development. The building will continue to rise over the coming year, with each floor taking two to three weeks to complete. As you can see to your right, the first shipment of the special gold anodized cladding that will adorn the cube has now arrived on site and from February the glistening golden exterior will begin to be installed, bringing the unique building to life. Late summer we'll see the topping out of the concrete frame of the cube structure with the intricate metallic fretwork screen beginning to take shape in the early autumn. Before you hear the rest of the talk, you have some time to look at questions 16 to 20. What has been accomplished to date in the city's regeneration has been nothing short of amazing. Yet, we hope to set a new benchmark for developments in Birmingham. The Cube will bring forward a new standard of architecture and a building which will not only be Birmingham's most striking waterside location, but also one which is identifiable around the world. The Cube breaks all the boundaries of what has been achieved in Birmingham so far. The finished cube will be a mixed-use building. It will house the city's first rooftop restaurant with panoramic views, whilst a boutique hotel and residential apartments below will feature internal views over the twisting atrium. Further down, high-specification Grade A office space is planned, with more exclusive retail and waterside restaurants at the base. The mailbox has already raised the bar in the quality and calibre of our architecture and the retail offerings, worldwide brand names and stylish restaurants have given Birmingham a contemporary profile, rivalling the capitals of Europe. 
From the outset, the Cube's design team sought to create a new landmark building for Birmingham, which fits into its context and which draws people in. Lined with coloured glass and with an exterior clad in shimmering metal fretwork, the Cube has visible links to Birmingham's heritage in engineering and jewellery manufacture. It was essential that the building created a strong visual presence, immediately identifiable as a gateway to the canal and city centre area to the north. Our city is a city of the future, and as a futuristic building with phenomenal foresight in style and design, the Cube is indicative of our plans in how we see Birmingham developing. The Cube will help to elevate us onto a global stage. Now, let's go and have a look at the progress of the entrance gateway. That is the end of part two. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now it turns to part three. Part three. You will hear a conversation between four students, Lynn, Thomas, Sophie and David. They are talking about one of their tutors, Marlena. First, you have some time to look at questions 21 to 25. Thomas, let's not go to the lab. Let's just stay here in the student lounge and drink tea and review the chapter. You know we can't do that. We've a responsibility to turn up and make sure our tutor has understood the week's lectures. If we don't go, no one will ever even realise she's got the theories all muddled up. Oh, really? Sophie, it's awful. Marlena just opens her mouth and I'm confused. Really, she... Marlena's our tutor. Yeah, I gathered that. You lot have got no manners. I was in the middle of saying something. <sighs> She'll say things that make no sense whatsoever. And I'm thinking I've misunderstood something. And I'm looking around the room and everyone has these looks on their faces of... Disbelief and merriment. <laughs> <sighs> Maybe you do, Thomas, but we're not all geniuses. Really, I'll be so worried that I've got it all wrong. Then people start asking questions and, by and by, we figure out that she's mixed something up. That's too bad. It's not a good situation at all. But surely you're exaggerating a bit, Lynn. No, it's awful. I don't know how she got through her undergraduate studies, much less got accepted as a postgrad here. You'd think our professor would have some idea about her abilities. Before you hear the rest of the conversation, you have some time to look at questions 26 to 30. Marlena's an unusual name. Is she English? She's Spanish, David. She's got a really strong accent. Really, that's a lot of the problem, I think. I don't think she's thick. She just doesn't communicate very well. I'm not sure she understands us completely, especially when someone's joking around. <laughs> and we do tease her a bit, I must admit. What a nightmare. I'd hate to have you in my class if I was a tutor, Tom. As long as you're clever, Sophie, you'd have nothing to worry about. But you've just said she's not thick. I think I've met her, actually. 
I think we had a class together maybe last year. She was really shy and quiet, hardly spoke the whole term, but she was always smiley and friendly. She seemed nice, actually, and I think she got one of the highest marks in the class. Maybe you've all picked on her so much that she's so nervous that she can't think clearly. Ever think of that? But we don't need to babysit. We need help. It's a difficult subject. Has anyone ever gone up and asked her for help individually? Yes, actually, I have. I couldn't understand one of the formulas in the first chapter. The theory about why it worked just made no sense to me. So I went and asked her about it, and she cleared it right up. She was very helpful. She's not thick. I already said that. She's just so much fun to torment, right? Yep, that's it. Lynn, if you're having trouble with something, why don't you make an appointment to meet with her individually and see if she can help you that way? Maybe you'd see a different side of her. I reckon she just hates getting up in front of the class, and I can hardly blame her. <sighs> yes, I could try that, I suppose. Guys, the, the tutors aren't old academics who've been teaching for 30 years. They're just like us, two years down the road if we're clever enough to continue with our education. I know I'd be mortified to get up in front of you lot, and I don't think I'll feel that differently in a couple of years' time. You know, we're far more experienced as students than they are as teachers. Hmm, you're right, David. Really, it's more like one of our mates is trying to help us out. But, you know, our mates aren't so frightened of us. Yeah, but you aren't so horrible to your mates, are you? That is the end of part three. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turns to part four. Part four. You will hear a talk on research in the Indian Ocean. First, you have some time to look at questions 31 to 40. In this, the first lecture in our series on the changing face of the oceans of the world, we are going to look at the Indian Ocean, into which the Oceanography Department at the Institute here in Australia has been doing pioneering research over the past five years. Let us start with some facts about the Indian Ocean to give you an idea of the scope and complexity of the enterprise we have undertaken. As you can see from the diagrams here on the screen, showing the relative size of the planet's five oceans, the Indian Ocean comes third after the Pacific and Atlantic Oceans, but is larger than the Southern Ocean and the Arctic Ocean. On this slide, you can see that the Indian Ocean is different from the two larger oceans in that it is landlocked to the north and does not extend into the cold regions of the North Pole. Covering some 73,440,000 square kilometres, the ocean constitutes approximately one-seventh of the Earth's surface and about 20% of the world's total ocean area. At the equator, it is around 6,400 kilometres wide, with the average depth being about 3,400 metres, and with the deepest point being the Java Trench at 7,450 metres. Flowing into the Indian Ocean, we have some of the world's greatest rivers. The Zambezi here, the Ganges here, 
the Indus, the Brahmaputra, and the Tigris Euphrates just here. The two largest islands in the Indian Ocean, Madagascar, here off the coast of Africa, and Sri Lanka, here off the southern tip of India, are structurally parts of the continents of Africa and Asia, while islands like the Seychelles are exposed tops of submerged ridges. The Maldives are low coral islands, and Mauritius and Réunion are volcanic cones. The surface waters of the ocean are warm, except where the ocean touches the cold waters to the south. A network of scientists, mainly oceanographers and meteorologists from around the world, are monitoring changes in the ocean's temperature and acidity, especially where it meets the southern ocean, in order to see how global warming is having an effect on the waters there. An assessment is also being carried out on how this is impacting on low-lying habitats and peoples in the more populated coastal regions around the rim of the ocean. In the warmer north, islands are vulnerable to even the subtlest changes in sea levels and tides, so they are being closely watched. Moreover, a close eye is being kept on wind changes, especially alterations to the monsoon rains, typhoons, cyclones, and any other natural phenomena. In addition to the information sent from the ship that we have stationed off Antarctica, in the south of the Indian Ocean, data are being transmitted round the clock from buoys anchored at various points around the ocean. Five of these buoys are observing ice packs and icebergs coming into the Indian Ocean from Antarctica. Besides the buoys, data on cloud cover and wind and temperature change are received by satellite. Satellite images are also being used to record the size of the icebergs from the moment they break off from Antarctica. Their course is then mapped as they move out into the Southern Ocean. Here at the Institute, the raw data from the various sources are received and the information is then constantly processed by a bank of computers. Once the data have been collated, the next step in the process is the analysis by experts here and at centres around the world looking for even the slightest shift in patterns of temperature, wind and sea levels. In the light of the fact that this is a global enterprise, the Institute is staffed 24 hours a day with researchers working in shifts, and we are in constant contact with centres all around the world. In total, 900 experts from around the globe are involved in the programme. The work at the Institute is now into the fifth year of a 10-year data collection which began in 2003. The analysis of the five years to 2008 will be published early in 2009. However, changes in patterns are already being noticed since the data have been gathered. That is the end of part four. You now have half a minute to check your answers.